morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. I spent uh, the, a couple of minutes asking folks, if you can't hear, just get closer to me. Get closer to the front of the room, but I didn't know we had a microphone. So thank you so much um, to everyone for coming this evening. This is uh, a critical issue that's impacting not only our districts, but many districts across New York City. Ours in particular has an outsized impact. Um, as I should always introduce myself, I'm so forgetting that. Um, good evening, my name is Alexa Viles. I am the new council representative for District 38. I'm um, so happy to be here. Can I take off my mask? Is that you okay? Um, I'm just fielding comments right now about the sound quality, but I don't know. Speak now and see if that's better for okay. people listening. Hi, can you hear me now? Okay, so um, again, thank you so much for being here. Um, and a special thanks to all of you who made this happen in some way. This agenda was created through community feedback. The reason why we are here is because of community feedback. We really wanted to hold this forum um, dedicated to Last Mile um, to make sure that you know this agenda is reflective of the things that we want to see that are happening and reflective of the concerns of the community. This is not a new issue. Our community has been having these conversations over a good number of years. There is, of course, some exhaustion and wanting to see progress um, and seeing actually more and more facilities get built. So we definitely understand the urgency here and um, this is such a critical topic for us all. So I just wanna express my appreciation for the collective nature of how this really came together. And this is really how we hope our team intends to work and will continue to work with our community to make sure that those voices and concerns are front and center. Um, it is not lost on me that I'm sitting in a room full of experts. Um, all of you bring expertise to tonight's conversation, whether it's that you live in Red Hook and you regularly observe improper roadway use on Van Brunt, or um, I'm losing my place here, excuse me. Um, or whether you see the Amazon vans or cars idling all day outside your apartment, or whether you have a degree in city planning, you all bring something very critical to our discussion. As you all know, last mile facilities have inundated and continue to inundate this community. While we in city government continue to think about legislative and planning solutions, I don't need to tell you that this audience that this process is far too slow to meet the real and immediate needs of our residents now. In tonight's conversation, I hope that we can focus not only on what is being done right now by the various agencies um, to address the issue of last mile facilities in our communities, but then to have a discussion on where, agent, on where the agency blind spots may be and the things that we have not been able to address. Through a dialogue between the agencies represented here tonight, we have DOT, we have DCP, we have EDC in the room. Unfortunately, um, uh, another agency, Port Authority. Port Authority, thank you friends, um, was also invited to participate. This is a multi-issue, a multi-agency issue, could not attend tonight but we will commit and we are committed to ensuring that we have interagency discussions because this is a complex issue that involves all of those agencies. We hope that you'll walk away from this conversation with a set of short-term action items that together we can work on to help begin mitigating the impact of the facilities on our lives and in the near future. And not in the distant future, maybe when we finally are able to get some real-term solutions and hopefully legislation that will help move forward. As I mentioned before, we have been in office six months, but I have been a resident of this community for decades, and so I'm well aware of the long-term conversations that have happened on 
these issues. In fact, I remember the IKEA fights when IKEA was getting cited here um, and the questions around jobs and land use. And so I take this very seriously, as, it, as does my team. So I want you to know that you have my commitment and the commitment of our office that we will leave here with more marching orders, with clarity. We will continue to represent the community's interests that come out of tonight's meeting and each and every day apply the pressure to the agencies and to our city government to take action now on what we are going to discuss here tonight and a commitment to continue to have those longer term discussions that are still so important. So now I just want to quickly walk you through the agenda. First, we will have a presentation from each of the agencies, starting with the Department of Transportation. After these presentations, we will break out into working groups where we can have focused conversations on what we're experiencing, what our needs are, um, in, in dialogue with the agencies. And then after that, we'll reconvene and share some takeaways, action items, uh, followed by time for Q&A. Uh, so first, before we, I hand this over to my colleague in CB6, I just should thank my team for getting this event together. It takes a village, so thank you to Edward and Christina, to Brian, to Sarai, to the whole team in District 38. Thank you, you worked so hard for our residents. I want to thank the agencies for being here, for heeding the call. It is no small feat to get three city agencies to show up on the same night, as all of you know. Um, yes. And lastly, uh, thank our host, PS15, for having us here in this space. Um, obviously, a community school that cares very deeply about the impacts of these facilities um, on the students and on our community. And thank you to our co-sponsor, Community Board 6, who is here, and we'll, I'll pass the mic to him. Uh, we are joined by Senator Bernardes, so thank you so much for being here, Senator. And I hope I didn't miss anyone. I wanna actually thank you, Carolina, for doing the great job of making sure this gets recorded so our residents will have a record of the conversation. Share um, your energy and your patience and your grace. We will push through this conversation and this is only the first of many more. So again, thank you and, and I'll turn it over to Mike at Community Board 6. Thank you. Um, I would basically second every single thing that the council member said. I was kind of making notes in my head, but then she, I was like, okay, I'll thank Carolyn for reporting it, but then she did it. So, uh, anyway, it's really great to see everyone here in person. My name is Mike Rassio, I'm the district manager of Brooklyn Community Board 6. For most of my tenure, we haven't met in person, so some of you are probably seeing me in person for the first time. Um, but this, to speak to the point that the council member made, this has been an issue for a long time. In my hands, I have three years worth of uh, policy statements on this, going back to uh, the fall of 2020, asking for Van Brunt, you know, through three DOT commissioners, two mayoral administrations, asking, for example, for DOT to not be a uh, truck route any longer, and things of that nature. We've written extensively on it, but this, I am encouraged and to. Uh, to the point that the council member made about the work to get three agencies in the room at once is not an easy task. So we're starting on that, and I think after today we'll have some progress, hopefully, and I'm here to listen on behalf of CB6. We have a few members here, and uh, I'll pass the mic back. And that's, I haven't done that in a while in person, so it feels pretty uh, good, and here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike. So I, I was confused, of course. Um, we are actually going to have the first presentation by DTP and then followed by DOT and EDC. Great. So, also, I'm gonna leave the DOT, the, all the CD6 policy statements, I guess, on the piano. It seems like a place where it's safe to get them, but, and for, to follow up for more information that we might be working on ways to contact us about various policy issues. Oh, the table, that sounds way better. <laughs> See, it's all about the music. Turn around. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, so, unlike many people, my question is not can you hear me? Am I too loud? <laughs> Good. Awesome. All right. So, my name is David Thomas Gray. I'm a transportation planner at Department C Planning, uh, joined here by some colleagues from DOT and EDC. And, like the council member said, 
um, the Port Authority cannot be here today, but they're here in spirit. We will be sharing the feedback that we get with them, and they are looking forward to participating in further conversations. Um, so we are gonna start just sort of um, talking about the... Uh, Can you dim the lights? Hmm? Can you dim the lights? It's hard to see that. Oh, how do I, how do, I do that? <laughs> well, there's probably light switches over there. Yeah. We'll take care of it. Okay, so we see together doing some research sort of to set the stage for these conversations. We're gonna talk really briefly about um, the industry, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and... Um, it's gonna be hard to see. That does help, thank you very much. So, starting off quickly, the state of the industry. Um, you can see that since 2012 to about 2018, um, <clears throat> Sorry, folks, the Zoom's not behaving well on the screen. Sorry, I thought it was Is that people? Okay. Uh, yes, so we have been experiencing, as you are very well aware, of human construction. Why? Um, the the, the manager of Bass and Greece has grown over the past decade. Um, from um, little change of plan. <laughs> so basically, we all know the e-commerce boom has brought more of these facilities to our neighborhoods, more trucks to our neighborhoods. Um, more than three quarters of total industrial inventory within the five boroughs is in Brooklyn and Queens. Sorry, thank you. Um, Staten Island has seen over three million square feet and 60% of that is Amazon. Um, and 2.1 million square feet is currently under development around the city as we speak. Um, it peaked in 2018 and again in 2020, but was a little bit more modest in 2021. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, you can kind of see the retail sales. Um, on the top is um, basically total sales. The bottom is e-commerce. And while the bottom doesn't look like it's that steep of a slope, um, it actually is an overall increase of about 15% or so. Um, so it's really jumped up from its initial, you know, 4.7% nationally. Um, COVID accelerated the uh, e-commerce boom, we all know that. Um, next slide, please. I'm not gonna read everything on the slides. So the logistics facilities vary in size. Um, there are traditional warehouses, which I think we're all familiar with in the city. They're commonly multi-story, very low ceiling heights, uh, little automation, a lot of human labor, and um, very high truck traffic. Um, the newer models are these high cube warehouses, which you can kind of see in the pictures on the left, uh, or on the right, rather, on my left. Um, and basically, they're typically one story with higher ceiling heights to accommodate the trucks. They have uh, different column spacing to allow for movement within the building. And we're starting to see more multi-story facilities around the city. Um, basically, these are a little bit more automated. They have lower numbers of employees and a little bit more moderate truck traffic. Um, this is the logistics chain. So, um, typically, things that are located outside of cities are more towards the top. Things that are located in cities are located more towards the bottom. And as you can see, there are receive centers, um, and those are typically located in the Lehigh Valley, northern New Jersey, the Jersey Turnpike. Um, then there are fulfillment centers, um, sortation centers, and the reason we're here tonight, the last mile delivery facilities. Um, Last mile warehouses in New York City tend to cluster, as we all know, places like Red Hook, Sunset Park, Maspeth, Long Island City, the South Bronx. Um, basically because the things that they need are here. The land is owned appropriately, there's available space for warehouses, there's access to highways and trunk routes, um, and proximity to customers. Um, I think, can we go back one? Sorry. Um, we talked about the neighborhoods that kind of fit these criteria where a lot of these are located. In addition, um, 
We've identified 46 different locations throughout the city, 16 in Brooklyn, five in the Bronx, two in Manhattan, 17 in Queens, and five in Staten Island. So that's an awful lot of facilities delivering goods to all of us. Next, please. So Red Hook um, has been at the forefront. You can see where the ones uh, in your neighborhood are located and their approximate sizes. Um, and there are other projects that are planned as well. Next. So what have we heard from you guys? And we're hoping to hear more tonight. But we've heard that um, because these are being developed as a right, the community doesn't get a say. The community gets no advance notice. We've heard that loud and clear. Um, the issue of communication, um, being aware of these so that you can react and, and interact appropriately with government and industry to improve upon them. Uh, enforcement, um, a lot of traffic violations that could be better enforced. Uh, environmental and social justice, um, these types of facilities tend to locate where land is a little cheaper and that tends to be where there are environmental justice communities, uh, communities of concern, communities of color, etc. cetera. Um, jobs, uh, basically, uh, M zone land is a valuable commodity in the city. So there's a concern about the loss of that land and the jobs it could produce to facilities that don't produce an awful lot of jobs. And finally, safety. Um, with all of these trucks rumbling through the neighborhood, uh, there are concerns over the, the safety of people crossing, um, pedestrians, bicyclists, um, and especially children, as we're in a school tonight. So we're very cognizant of that. Um, beyond Red Hook, so we're, we're looking at this, it's a problem in Red Hook, but it's a problem in other neighborhoods in the city. So we've expanded, um, basically if you look in Red Hook, the industry is more uh, interspersed with the residential units. Comparing it to Maspeth, where there's a lot more actual activity, um, it's a lot more segregated from the residential uses around. Yes? Can I just make a suggestion? All of these things are at a scale that they're not ascertainable in the back or even on my camera. So if you can point out to people who don't know what color is industry. Purple. Purple on this map is industry. And pink as well, right? Uh, yes. Next, please. Okay, so basically, uh, IBCs across the city have varying attributes. And what we're trying to do is figure out the similarities and differences so that we can figure out which areas are prone to these, which areas we need to safeguard. Um, and you know, in the case of Red Hook, the NYCHA developments um, have very different economic characteristics than other parts of the city. We're aware of that. Um, so uh, there are more economic justice concerns in Red Hook than, than in other parts of the city as well. So moving on. Uh, we looked at employment in transportation and warehousing, um, the QCEW, which is the quarterly census of economic something or other, I forget the W. Um, but uh, basically, 11% of total jobs in the Southwest Brooklyn IBC are within transportation and warehousing. Um, this IBC is among the largest overall in the city, so it has the highest total people working in that particular sector, and it's comparable to uh, the IBCs in Long Island City, Maastricht, and Zurita in the Bronx. Uh, moving on. The median salary of all occupations in the city is a little over $58,000. Entry level average is about 32,000. Experience is about 104,000 and the transportation and material moving occupation sector, uh, median salary is about 41,000. So it just kind of gives you a sense. Um, within these warehouses, there are positions that have relatively higher salaries. Those are your distribution managers, your heavy truck drivers, but your sales workers, your packers and packagers, and your stockers are lower median salaries. Uh, moving on. So, we're kind of doing our homework now and looking at potential regulatory approaches. Um, and with respect to last mile distribution centers, 
you know, we need to establish zoning districts that provide sufficient suitable opportunities for businesses to locate and that those businesses can support the city's residents and economy. Um, zoning limits truck intensive activities. Um, basically, M districts and CA commercial districts. Uh, warehouses and distribution facilities are, are really intended to be located in districts that do not permit housing. Um, and the distribution system requires facilities to locate basically where they can effectively get the product in and then get it out to all of us in our homes. Um, and they want to do it in a safe and efficient manner, reducing unnecessary traffic. So we're in, at the moment looking at the potential for zoning regulations or other incentives to produce a better distribution of facilities around the city, limit the clustering, um, as well as um, promote safety, air quality, public health, and other outcomes beneficial to neighborhoods. Next. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Denise, at the Department of Transportation. Sir, can you explain your name and your title? Yeah, sure, my name is Jack Schmidt. Jack Schmidt, and I'm Director of Transportation Engineering at the Department of Thank you, Jack. Good evening, everyone. My name is Denise Mendez. I'm the Director of Freight Mobility at the New York City Department of Transportation. I want to thank you, thank Council Member, uh, thank you, Council Member, for inviting us. Um, we're happy to be here and continue to engage uh, with the community uh, on this important issue. So, just to start off, our freight vision is really anchored by strategic plans that we released last year, uh, as well as other agency and partner uh, plans. Uh, so, uh, delivering New York, delivering Green. And our partner, EDC, which you'll hear uh, from later, um, Freight NYC, which is really thinking about how do we ensure that our last mile of freight network and the ecosystem surrounding that is safe, it's efficient, more sustainable, um, and equitable in terms of the uh, impacts or effects that, that we uh, might, might see. Uh, next slide. Uh, I just also want to highlight that New York City DOT's uh, streets plan that was released uh, late last year um, also identifies Sunset Park and Red Hook as priority investment areas, and this is also critical in terms of where we want to allocate resources uh, to communities in need. Um, I'll also highlight that uh, the waterborne uh, freight area priorities is also highlighted uh, on the edge here as well uh, as potential opportunities for us to activate uh, the waterways to bring more freight in by water. Um, that helps us to reduce our over-reliance on trucking, which is our agency's and the city's long-term goal uh, for moving goods more efficiently and safely with the um, Just a little bit more descriptive uh, features about these last mile facilities in terms of what we understand. The magnitude, the intensity of the types of trips uh, that are generated, all are a function of the building lot and size, uh, as well as the type of facility. Um, and uh, my colleague Jack um, highlighted the different types of facilities, sortation, fulfillment, last mile facilities. All of them have different characteristics in terms of the types of trucks uh, and the size of them and how many of them uh, particularly delivering um, cheap predictive facilities. Uh, so there are inbound trips, which are kind of the high volume transfer that are stopping these facilities. There are trips that are associated with employees that are going to those particular facilities. And then lastly, there are trips where the local goods are being delivered to a customer, you or myself, or other businesses. Uh, the movement of goods, for example, uh, you see a different types of trucks, so you may have your long haul, larger trucks that are bringing uh, goods from the Lehigh Valley or the larger warehouse facilities, uh, all the way down to cars or even cargo bikes that are making deliveries at the last mile per outgoing. On the operational side, uh, these trips are typically distributed throughout the day, uh, although uh, some activity may peak during the network peak, and 
This is the reason why we need to understand more site level and context sensitive uh, trip generation estimates, and that's something that DOT is committed to evaluating um, for these facilities so that we can be better informed and understand how many trips are being generated and what is their cumulative impact. Uh, so just a little bit more context on DOT's review and coordination uh, as we launch for these particular facilities. Typically, uh, we uh, intercept these uh, through our curb cut review. So if there's a, a facility that's within 50 feet from an intersection, um, that's usually a trigger that comes to, DO, to DOT. Um, for our division, you know, we get that from the Department of Buildings. We review these if these are as of right developments. Uh, and our review focuses on ensuring that the curb cuts um, are properly sized these maintain safe and efficient operations, essentially. Um, but DOT, again, and that's why we're here today, we're committed to working with our agency partners, including the Department of Buildings, who's not here today, but have expressed interest in working with us uh, to provide more visibility of these facilities, not just in Red Hook, but also um, across the city. Alongside DOT's traditional safety improvements, we're advancing a series of multi-pronged multimodal freight strategies and initiatives, all of which work together to help reduce the impact and also make uh, the last mile a lot more sustainable and greater. So this is just a snapshot of DOT's safety toolbox. We implement street improvement projects citywide, uh, and we like to think that our ability to implement uh, some of these improvements uh, are actually a lot quicker because some of these are temporary materials, but really give a big bang for a buck in terms of safety improvements. Next slide. Uh, DOT's freight toolkit is really emphasizing thinking about how we better manage demand during the most congested times of the day, ensuring safe um, network uh, connectivity uh, and curb access, so providing access to loading zones, making sure that we manage our truck route network and introducing more conflict-reducing designs between vulnerable road users and also um, the truck-related um, uh, movement throughout our city. Uh, we also uh, are emphasizing and building out our sustainability delivery uh, practices, and you'll hear more, a little bit more about that for our commercial cargo bike program, as well as our efforts to promote truck electrification alternative fuels that can really help to green out the, the last mile of the service transportation. And lastly, blue highways, which we're partnering with EDC on to activate our waterways to bring more freight in by water. Next slide. Um, so starting off with kind of the, 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 the bread and butter, as we heard um, from the gentleman from CB6, uh, general interest by the community to look at the truck route network changes, and we look forward to hearing from you during our breakout sessions about alternative options uh, for routing trucks through um, the neighborhood. In general, truck routes constrict and really organize um, truck activity. Uh, it's influenced by several factors, uh, but our goal is really to minimize the effects on communities. Uh, we do that through engineering, education, and enforcement with our partners at NYPD. And we'll also take your feedback about you know, how effective enforcement is because that's also part of the conversation as well. Next slide. Do you hear the underlying loud? I heard that, I heard that. And we're here to, to listen and think about objective ways to go about that. At the state level, um, our agency has been advocating for more effective means of enforcing our rules and that be through technology means. So these are things that we're constantly advocating for and we certainly look to uh, members of our elective community to help to push and advocate for those changes in Albany. We already have improvements to uh, enforce uh, some of our violations. DOT and the city would like more expanded authority to enforce our rules using technology. Um, the way that we typically manage the truck route network um, through sign is through signs, and you'll see some of those along truck routes. Uh, and uh, 
at intersections for truck routes going off to a local street um, to restrict truck activity. May I ask one question? Define truck. A what truck? is the length of this truck that you speak? So um, a truck is defined as a vehicle with two axles and six tires in the traffic rules. Um, we have a variety in terms of the length. So single unit trucks, uh, they go up to 35 feet in length, and the tractor trailer combination can go up to 55 feet. That is the legal limit for single unit and tractor trailer combination trucks. Really? Yes. So I'm um, more than happy we have some truck routes um, that we'll be able, truck route maps that we'll be able to give you that has a lot of information about our rules and the size of trucks, etc. We understand and know them, but they are not enforced. And we'd be more than happy to have that conversation with, um, with NYPD, which we are working very closely with. Um, I just want to continue moving on to the rest of the presentation, and we'd be more than happy to take more questions after all of the presentation. Um, next slide. Um, so our cargo bike program has expanded significantly since the launch in 2019. We're working with the larger operators like the UPS, the FedExes of the world to shift deliveries from larger trucks to smaller, more sustainable, and space efficient vehicles. Um, our goal is really to make this uh, program a lot more effective and by announcing more permanent rules to make these more of a mainstay uh, as a, an effective option or alternative for delivering goods. Next slide. Um, our clean truck program, which started in 2012 and expanded in 2020, is now targeting uh, all industrial business zones. Initially, it started in the Hunts Point area. The success of that program is significant. They were able to reduce particulate matter um, for almost 600 trucks by 96%. That program has in, been injected with additional funds, and now we're um, seeing kind of a broader um, application. South Sunset Park and Red Hook are both eligible to receive funds in terms of the businesses that are operating here, and we are proactively engaging with the South Brooklyn uh, Industrial Development Corporation to target businesses that are serving this area. We want to make sure that the benefits of these emissions are felt and realized by this community. Next slide. Um, our Blue Highways program really folks focuses on activating on New York City waterways. Um, so uh, you may have seen in the news, and you'll hear from our partners at ABC, uh, in April there was a test by UPS to bring these trailer barges uh, by water to avoid them using the roadway network. We want to see more of that, and there's an opportunity for us to work and go after federal funds to build out our infrastructure to do just that. Uh, so we're releasing an RFPI or solicitation to get interesting parties and, and uh, folks uh, from uh, who are interested in testing these solutions. We'll be releasing a solicitation this summer uh, to evaluate uh, opportunities for us to go into a broader pilot program. Next slide. We are working also with EDC to identify opportunities to electrify uh, the trucks that are operating in New York City and building out infrastructure to support that. Um, this is an area where we'll also be going after the federal funds for the infrastructure bill that was passed last year. Excellent. Um, also, the last council uh, district release, council um, cohort released a local law and that require DOT to establish or find ways to support uh, micro distribution. We think these can complement, be complemented uh, by marine uh, freight trans transloading. Um, and we're releasing um, another solicitation this summer to then re release a report at the end of the year with our findings uh, and then look to establish a pilot program next year. These uh, facilities can help to better organize the transfer of goods. Uh, and help to really streamline the ecosystem. Next slide. Uh, another way to incentivize uh, cleaner vehicles is designating space at the curb. Uh, so we're looking at opportunities to 
do that through green loading zones, and we'll be hearing more about that later this year. Next slide. That covers uh, just the broad uh, principles. We'll be talking about kind of our broad next steps uh, at the end uh, of my colleague from EDC's presentation. So, Andrew, again, take it away. Thanks, Denise. Talk at a normal level. So, uh, so uh, it's uh, great to be here, and I want to thank the council member for inviting us. Uh, and it's uh, you know it's important for us to be out in the community and to talk to your constituents and um, you know really hear you know uh, what is going on in the neighborhood so that we can uh, you know redouble our efforts. Um, and I wanted to say that this is a team effort. You know, uh, uh, Denise is kind of our uh, she is our uh, our den mother uh, between uh, city planning and EDC, and we've been meeting regularly for several years uh, at, uh, to try to anticipate these changes in the supply chain in New York City. And that's really what we're seeing is a profound change uh, in the supply chain and uh, trying to meet the moment. So, uh, so again, I'm Andrew Gann, I'm a senior vice president for transportation, been at EDC for a bit, uh, Jerry Armour. Hello, good to see you. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to talk about you know, this modernized freight distribution system, um, how we want to move uh, more freight by other means than by trucks. Um, although they may be on trucks, they may never get into the neighborhood. That's the goal. Uh, and then I'll sort of summarize next steps so then we can then go into the workshops where we can really kind of get into the into things. So the good news is, uh, as Elizabeth Warren would say, we have a plan. Uh, maybe we have three plans, right? Um, we uh, at ABC started with Freight NYC back uh, in uh, 2018, um, and then we worked uh, with DOT on a another level of this, delivering green and delivering New York. And really what this is has been an iterative process for us to kind of you know, um, meet the moment by looking at how we can make freight movement um, supply chain into New York City more efficient. And, uh, across the board, because it doesn't really work for anyone. It's really bonkers. You know, New York City has a system that really, um, we're the victim of um, the post-war era, the interstate highway system, the disaggregation of supply chains, and we are just mainly a receiver, but we're also a pass-through for Long Island and five million people out there. And that's why we feel on I-278 here every day. So, um, so key to all this, of course, is greening the supply chain. Like, if we are able to decarbonize and move towards that, and right now we have this moment in Washington, we hope it lasts, you know, to get funding and all of the things that uh, Denise mentioned. Um, uh, and key, another key for us, and it's been coming up and continues to come up, is compliance. You know, 53-foot uh, trucks are illegal in New York, except in two areas. Uh, uh, JFK Airport and Howland Hook Marine Terminal. So FYI, that's 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 an area of uh, compliance. Overweight trucks beyond 80,000 pounds are not legal in New York. So um, the good news is a lot of these things can move legally by water. So that's our hook here. Um, and it's important that we do enforcement so that the industry understands the price signal. You know, it's a hard job being a trucker. No trucker wants to be in New York City. They're here because we're here. We're the we're the giant um, uh, market. Um, uh, so, but EDC, um, in our role as kind of the steward of the city's maritime and rail assets, we have a big role to play because uh, of our. You know, we we are the mini port authority. Uh, the port authority is our partner, and they're a good partner. Um, but our goals are to move more freight by road and by water, I'm sorry, by rail and by water. Um, and, uh, you know, um, if you just go to the next slide, I can just keep going into this. So one, one way is like to just, uh, you know, as uh, Jack Schmidt was saying, like we have to look at the whole system. And one of the things that we hear in the Northeast is that everybody is suffering from the same issues, right? That uh, cities, from Maine down to Virginia are looking at um, the I-95 corridor and turning it into the M-95 corridor and moving more freight by water. And so we in the Port Authority and these other uh, ports uh, and port cities started the North Atlantic Marine Highway Alliance, which uh, where we exchange information about 
uh, how we get pr primarily the big trucks off the road or the containers off the road. And there's a lot of receptivity because it doesn't make sense for the industries either. They don't want to be stuck on 278 or I-95. You know, they're not making money, uh, but the waterways offer a, a new, new capacity. Um, and so uh, working with them, working with our partners also at USDOT, um, we have um, created um, New York Harbor. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We have created um, uh, a um, marine highway node in New York Harbor that's both in New York and New Jersey, which means that we qualify for federal money to upgrade our port facilities. Uh, next slide. And I did want to point out this. We already have a marine highway at Red Hook Container Terminal. Uh, and uh, 120,000 trucks a year never touch the streets of Red Hook because containers are all loaded on ships. They go to Port Newark uh, on two uh, container barges that were purchased with federal money back in the 1990s. And we can leverage this as an asset. You know, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of benefit from just using what we have. You know, Red Hook Terminal has a satellite facility in Port Newark. Uh, so they can short circuit. They've been a great partner. I would also point out, you know, the infrastructure at Red Hook is very old. The infrastructure in uh, the ports in New Jersey is very old and needs to be renewed. And we collectively should be advocating for the renewal of these port facilities um, and also decarbonization. Next slide. Um, so one thing we're very excited about, and Again, all of this working with DOT, uh, hand in glove on the Blue Highway, is um, we just uh, applied for a grant. Um, these are the, the M95 and the M87. Uh, those are the two kind of um, our main marine highways that serve New York Harbor. And um, with the grant, we will be uh, hopefully turning on six locations um, that are like mini terminals um, in the EDC uh, portfolio. Uh, that's Hunts Point up in the Bronx because that's a, obviously a very big, important node of freight. Stuyvesant Cove at 23rd Street um, in Manhattan. Pier 36 uh, in Manhattan, which is just a little bit down here uh, near Chinatown. Um, the downtown heliport here. And this way, kind of serving that important sort of Manhattan market. Um, and also in your district, council member, the 23rd Street Pier and the uh, 29th Street Pier, where, again, the idea is they turn on these systems so that we can move freight by water. In the next slide, I'll show you how it's done. So there's different types of marine highway. This is important for our workshops, so uh, please, we, we want to talk about this. The first one Denise mentioned to you, which is this um, a big, uh, this is all big freight. So this is trailers, tractor trailers from New Jersey uh, going uh, to uh, fulfillment centers by water using barges. And by the way, the barge company that we've been working with is Hughes Marine, who you all know is located right here in Erie Basin. And they've been a great partner along with Red Hook Terminal. Um, Red Hook Terminal actually applied for a federal grant using that designation and won a $1.4 million grant to fit out a barge to be able to handle these trucks by water. Um, the other thing in, in the district, council member and, and, and the audience is, you know, we have this system that's sanitation set up, which is a great system of uh, moving an outward flow of containers in container barges that can be stacked um, efficiently. These, this is, you know, uh, the garbage export program, the solid waste export program, every day is taking trucks uh, that used to go to uh, landfills in New Jersey. Now it goes to Staten Island by water, gets offloaded, goes on to trains that go to the landfills in other states. So, but we can use this model and we understand the economics of this model because the city pays for this service. Uh, next slide. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of like the second to last mile uh, high, uh, marine highway types. And uh, I, I mentioned this before, you know, we're really moving this forward. It was exciting because the first time UPS um, tried this, they, they rented a bunch of containers that were sort of uh, plain clothes containers. And that was a year ago. And then they liked it so much. And, and then uh, they did it again with their um, uh, logo uh, trailers. And um, that time Carlina caught us. So she, uh, she was there in the water in her kayak and saw us uh, moving that. But 
Uh, uh, but a captain told me. Yeah. No secrets in the harbor. <laughs> I got a phone back. That's probably the, That's right. But, uh, but it was fun because it, it showed the executives at UPS that this market could be served by water, which, as we know, they own a big site uh, down the block on Walcott Street. So then the next slide is um, this is the, uh, the small freight. And this is um, uh, really uh, picks up the point that Denise uh, made very well, which is these kinds of cubes, you know, uh, or we call it the e quads or e waters, which. Um, can be put onto ferry boats. And again, you can see we're not hiding our apartments here, but uh, there are other firms that are doing this. They're not the only ones. But the idea is that if we can use small freight to go to those sites that I showed you on, on the map, that's a way where freight can come in by big truck by water and then leave by ferry boat and go to serve the, uh, the last mile uh, market uh, by water. And you don't see a truck now. This is what we're working towards. It's hard work, uh, but we need we need everyone to sort of uh, you know get behind us in doing this vision. Um, and the next slide. Um, there's another type which small freight can be done, which is lift on, lift off uh, with cranes. Uh, there's a service between uh, Connecticut and Long Island that operates every uh, every day with foodstuffs uh, farm to table by water, and that uses a crane that's on a vessel. And again, this is neat because you could then go from the back of a warehouse that's on a water body, the Gowanus Canal, the Newtown Creek, and then move it to a, a final destination totally by water. So, next slide. And then, uh, gonna do a little bit of a pivot here. Uh, next slide. And just to say that, you know, another issue for us down in Sunset Park, in, uh, where EDC has many, many properties, South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, Brooklyn Army Terminal, uh, Bush Terminal, and the mini campus is, you know, realizing that we have to make changes on the land side because um, we have this funky situation of we have trains. That's another goal of ours, of course, is to move more freight by, uh, by train. This is the train that carries the municipal uh, solid, uh, the recyclables from the Sims recycling plant to the steel mill in Cleveland, um, and it does it uh, by rail, and just keep in your mind that one rail car is worth four semi-trucks in terms of weight, and that's why rail is so efficient. Port Authority runs this railroad, they do a really great job, but um, the problem is like the, the volume of traffic on 2nd and 1st Avenue has to be addressed, so uh, in addition to repairing some of those streets, I know when you get off the highway and you bounce over the railroad tracks, we're fixing that. We're taking out the cobblestones, we're gonna build a, a, a normal street, um, and we're also going to, in doing so, create one-way uh, pairs on 1st and 2nd Avenue, so the trains will run better. So, just wanted to bring that, I know we're in Red Hook, but uh, a little shout out to Sunset Park. And then, a little farther afield, but this is all connected, is we're building a rail transport center in Long Island City, which is another big freight neighborhood. Um, just to, to improve the economics of moving freight by rail. Um, and uh, this one, uh, we hope, will be built in a couple of years. Next slide. And that's it for me. And now I'm gonna do a summary quickly, and then we'll do Q&A and then workshop. No. No. We'll do some workshops and Q&A. Okay. So just to sum up, you know, the, uh, you know, we are, we're trying to meet the moment. We have these plans, you can read them. Uh, they're all online, ABC's website, DOT's website. It's, it's good stuff. Um, we need to work closely with the Port Authority because they're the big freight agency. Most of the freight comes from west of New York City, you know, not east of New York City. So uh, they're, they're important. Um, we, uh, as Denise said, we are working actively on RFEIs and RFPs that will say to the industry, New York is open for business and we want to change the, uh, the method and the means in which we're moving freight into and out of the city at these key sites. Um, you know, the, the Red Hook Container Terminal will launch a service, you know, we'll invite everybody to the launch uh, when we're ready. Uh, we want to continue, you know, really pushing on zero emissions and decarbonization. Now we, yes. Sorry, the RFEIs and the RFPs that you refer to, are those specific to Red Hook or are those New York in general? Um, well, let's see. So, micro distribution centers, Denise? 
city line, right? And then Marine Highway would be Dock NYC sites, um, which would be uh, in uh, the two two in uh, Sunset Park, uh, but also the key is also the Manhattan sites as well. You right. Know. So these are city wide, not specific to Red Hook. No, but we're working with the local partners here, like the Container Terminal and some of the uh, companies like UPS and Amazon, so that they get it, you know, and they're part of these you know, these efforts. Uh, and let's see, then supporting uh, the, you know, zero emissions, landside street improvements like the one-way pair, uh, and then wherever we can get funding opportunities, and that's where we need letters of support from everyone uh, to, to really show the federal government that we want this. Uh, next slide. And then continuing to coordinate and engage on the last mile uh, facilities, um, really working you know, with the Department of Buildings, you know, um, because these are new building types, and uh, really understanding and monitoring how they perform. Um, working with the Port Authority um, across, you know, and this is important. We are working with New Jersey DOT, especially because they are suffering from the same things in places like Newark, uh, Elizabeth, uh, Bayonne. Um, and you know, building, we're making sure that those facilities in those places are also looking at waterborne um, infrastructure so that they can go into the city in any one of those kinds of um, uh, marine consists that we were showing before. Um, working you know, with the freight industry, uh, the developers, um, you know, the private developers to give them the message, this is the way the city wants to go. Um, and then, you know, we're doing a lot of in-depth research, you know, with experts uh, working closely with DOT on, uh, uh, with um, uh, uh, consultants that um, are seeing these similar trends in other cities. You know, we're not the only ones, but also looking at best practices, so how we can adopt these and also make sure the economics of these new systems uh, works. Um, and next slide. Um, and again, uh, you know, uh, you know, resiliency is important. That's you know, and a lot of the story here is about resiliency. We only have you know two ways in and out of New York City, really, which is the George Washington Bridge mainly. That's thirty thousand truck trips a day, and the Verrazano, which is ten thousand truck trips a day, a day. So we have to you know, um, uh, resiliency is also comes in that, you know, and Carlina, you know best, right? How does the goods come in if we use the waterways more efficiently? But also when we modernize these port facilities, we have to bring them up a level like we did at Sims or, we, or at the IKEA site and really do this in a holistic way. So that's important. Um, the Red Hook Neighborhood Transportation Study, that's obviously very relevant and, you know, that continues so we really get into kind of what's going on in the streets. Uh, and then in Sunset Park, you know, similar, really looking at how, how the streets can function better for the trucks that, you know, the, the green trucks, hopefully, that have to be on, uh, on the road um, for last mile. And I think that, uh, next slide. Uh, that's it, okay. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll hand it back to someone. Thank you, folks. Uh, I, what we're going to do is I have a, a ton of questions, and I know you all have a ton of questions and comments. What we're going to do is break out into three groups, um, land use and zoning, transportation strategies, um, and community engagement. So land use and zoning is going to be right next door into the gym. Transportation is going to stay here in the auditorium, and community engagement is going to be right outside in the lobby. We're gonna we're gonna talk for thirty minutes. I expect y'all are gonna ask a lot of questions. Our agencies will be at each of those meetings. Um, I think what we want to know, um, you know, I, I what I mentioned earlier is we we want to talk about short term solutions, right? We, we don't want the 30 year view. Um, we covered here a lot of citywide stuff and we want to hear what's particularly pertinent and happening here in Red Hook. Obviously, my mind is in Sunset Park too because we share the same waterfront. Um, so I hope that will come out in the discussions. Uh, I know I don't need to tell Red Hook to make your voices heard. Um, Reminder, um, if a group is too small, like we shift into another group and we will continue to have a conversation. We will mine everything that happens here and follow up. We'll reconvene, we'll share what we heard and what is being said. 
and then we will wrap up and follow up for another conversation. So I think with that, um, land use and zoning, again, right next door in the gym, transportation will stay here, and community engagement in the lobby. What would you consider Thank you. That's a great question. Which, where, which group should oh, we go? No, no. We want legal compliance by law already on the books. So it depends. I think both, both, right? The, I would say the transportation feels like a big compliance issue. Yeah, so we. We yeah, we invited you to come up here so we can have a more intimate conversation. Don't be shy. Yeah. What, we, what we have is a, a map that has, um, as much as we could put down, kind of what the system is today, okay, with, um, you know, the Red Hook Terminal, South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, the rail uh, facilities, um, the industrial business zones, um, which are kind of in these uh, blue lines. And then we have overlaid on those the significant maritime and industrial areas, right, which are really protected by the state's coastal zone uh, management program. It says this, this is working waterfront, basically. Um, and then we've also identified kind of um, signage improvement projects that DOT has done in these areas. So those, those are the, uh, the, the purple and magenta boxes. Um, we have some of the um, ongoing street projects, I guess in mm -hmm. yellow, yeah. green, and red. Red being ongoing, and then EDC projects in orange. Um, uh, and really wanted to, yeah, talk talk through where your where issues are, where you're seeing concerns, you know, and tell yeah. us anything and everything. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, can we sort of like start? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think one of the main things that um, for me has been standing out in in general in this conversation conversation is that. It kind of feels like we're talking about how to optimize the streets for trucks, yes. and I think there might be a need to like yeah. refocus yeah. even conversations like this on all the things that we're learning. Sound really interesting, but there's a missing piece, which is people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So yeah, that's kind of like a larger view. Yeah. Yeah. Thing yeah. I think yeah. I wanted to share. Right. Sure. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for sharing. Um, very, one very quickly. Uh, uh, Mayor de Blasio uh, had a big deal press conference back in December. Yeah. It yeah. was reawakening maritime. Yes. That's it's what we've all been talking about for yes. years. Yes. Uh, it makes sense. Yes. Uh, it gets rid of all the BQE congestion. It gets rid of trucks. Uh, it sounded like a done deal. I don't know if it was a last gasp press conference, no. if it was just PR. I don't know, but they, 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 they even uh, brought out these new USPS yeah, yeah, battery-operated yeah, yeah. trucks. That's right. This whole thing. But it was reawakening yeah. South Brooklyn yes. as a maritime center. Yes. And uh, all of these places are on the water. Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes. There are deep trenches. There's infrastructure, of course, that's got to be built into yeah. it. But uh, uh, the, the former head of EDC said he's been working on this for 10 years. Yeah. It's... Is that, so, was that no, all no, bullshit? No, no, no. So no, no, first no. I want to address the first gentleman's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. comment. Um, I think that's a, a, an important one in terms of moving people and goods. I think. Uh, and I also want to say not only moving, but people staying, sure. people spending time in public places, people getting together in public, sure. and sort of the impacts that we see from this, not only for people, not only not for vehicles, but for people, and not only mm -hmm. for people moving, but people spending time in public space and honestly just sleeping with right. the existence of uh, moving traffic. Right, so like and, and that really gets to the place making and really like actually finding opportunities to enjoy the spaces, mm -hmm. right? Um, one of the things that uh, Andrew highlighted and you know, you'll be hearing more about that in the fall is a dedicated neighborhood transportation study to address some of the issues that you're hearing. So you will be coming to you again this fall on focused engagement to really get a lot of that feedback and to address issues related to vulnerable road users. We know that the community has expressed general interest and requests for a dedicated study and, and we've been able to secure funding uh, to be able to do just that. 
When is that study taking place? It's going to start in the fall. That was at the end of our presentation. Okay. Um, and I, what I want to say, because I've, I've written this, and I've said this at other meetings, the problem with doing it in the fall, and I verified that DOT does take into account the people, the current truck group, and I've got the community camera right now, Bay Street is right here, right? It bisects the parks. And if you're doing that study in the fall, you are not capturing the intense use of the parks here, the pool, mm -hmm. the Red Hook food vendors, the park users, or the Red Hook farm. So if you do it in the fall, you're showing your trucks, but not those people users, as he was saying. So thank you, Carolina. Car it's okay. I, I want to make sure My I'm pronouncing it. My friend is Carolina. Carolina C, whatever you're close to. Okay, Carolina. That was not the time, but thank you. Well, first of all, I want to make sure that I'm pronouncing your name properly. Um, we also have means to evaluate seasonality um, in, in, in traffic, mm -hmm. uh, and that will allow us to bridge those gaps. When we say beginning in the fall 2021, we mean points of engagement with the community as well. So the team that's working on that study will likely be collecting some information to get to general understanding, and they'll be coming to you to get input on broader data collection plans, et cetera. So that is something that, you know, it's from a point of engagement with the community, you'll be hearing from them in the fall. But your point is well taken. We received that feedback. I, think, I believe you were the same person that yes, gave that feedback. I was the one who brought it up before. before. Yes. But I'm sort of so seeing it on this particular yes. recording. So thank you. Heard. Thank you. We appreciate that. So does that address, um, at least from a general I mean, kind of... Yeah, yes, and I just don't want to take more space for no, 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 everyone No, 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 that's fine. I, I do want uh, to I I I, also say that the behind all this is a balanced plan of mm -hmm. public realm development, like things mm -hmm. like certainly understanding the greenway that begins in, uh, at uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park, continuing safely along the side of the uh, container terminal, to Ikea Park across, you know, all of that. We're working with the bike team, you know, at, uh, at DOT. May I just point yeah. one thing out? In terms sure. of scale, Yes. 4th Avenue, 3rd Avenue, look at the size, the width of the, the streets. These are four or five lane divided highways in comparison to that. And you're talking about bringing everything in there. This looks great, but you got to get it from there to there. Third and Avenue. you're still not even doing anything about compliance. Third Avenue is currently no truck a gets nightmare a ticket with trucks right down now. here. Mm -hmm. And I, show me a truck at 53 confined, combined. Mm -hmm. Show me. This is Mary Dudine. She runs Dudine. Dudine, sorry. It's been 15 years. <laughs> well, okay. It was, it was addressed briefly right, earlier right. that it's compliance is not the DOT's job. Or, however, it is part of the interaction with the neighborhood. There's the uh, the new Amazon warehouse on Bay Street. Yeah. There's a lovely bike lane that the DOT put in on Bay Street. That bike lane is blocked every single day by double parked vehicles that are going into or working at that Amazon warehouse. Okay, that's that's not acceptable. I re I ride my bike every day. It's a danger to me. There's a school on the corner. The compliance issue has got to be dealt with. It, yeah. it really, it, it's, it's it's not enough to say you got to talk to the to precinct. Keep about yeah. That's not enough. And not have those trucks off the one, Well, one one point I do want to make too is that you know, as we said, the delivering green uh, announcement that the former mayor made has been carried into uh, the current administration. Yep. Yeah, this is so this has been adopted. And the, the goal of this is what we said at the press conference, which is, as we said, use the waterway so yes. that the streets are not uh, you know, overtaxed and that, and, and that yes. only, the, only the, the trucks that, you know, that, are, that have to be there you know, uh, are there, but everything else that's not serving the community. We haven't right. heard and anything right. from the current mayor about it, so I don't know. Okay, if, if, if we'd be more than happy to relay that information. Yes. In addition to that, for the trucks that are remaining, making them greener and safer. So that's where a lot of the bulk of our presentation also talked right. about the culture of compliance is a huge issue. Yeah. We recognize that, and, yeah. and we've also put forward recommendations and plans to get more mm -hmm. authority from Albany to enforce our rules, Yeah. right? We want to be armed with, the, with, with more information and opportunities to do that. 
Um, I understand the frustration. I'm sorry? There, Isn't that called a traffic violation? Yeah. Right, I understand that. Yeah. And we want to make sure that we, we hear, hear other, other voices. So, Compliance um, is a huge I'm issue. Florence Neal, and I've oh, been living sorry. at uh, 353 Van Brunt and started a nonprofit 32 years ago, Kentler International Drawing, Drawing yeah. Space. And, um, but many of these buildings were built in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. Some had fallen down. Uh, John McGettrick just said yes. Columbia Street had a lot of uh, buildings that collapsed. That's a danger. Our, our buildings move at the slight pothole. So the weight of these trucks, plus there's no foundation, as we know. This is, if it rains, we're yeah. all bouncing. It's silt. Um, so why do the building owners, uh, the danger to people, again, living there, and the toxic fumes, mm -hmm. What are we going to do, you know? And also your two-way pairing. Does that mean you're going to make this one way and That's this one way? That's not here. Okay. That's for, uh, and, uh, and I'm afraid your solution is going to be, no. oh, we'll make this so, one way. And no. so this is something that, you know, we've also heard from the community. Wait, in terms excuse me, of, didn't RHCR say the other night they're making Van Brunt one way? I don't not believe that. No. Sorry, hi. hi. I'm Neg Laku, DOT Resiliency. Okay, great. I was uh, Glad you're here. part of the uh, presentation last week. Just curious, show of hands, how many people saw the presentation, Red Hook Coastal Resiliency? Okay. Van Brunt is not being proposed. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad I no. misheard that. No. But it is a neighborhood scale coastal flood protection project that is in the design phase, and it is, you know, how these projects of this magnitude. I think the um, as of right now our construction finish date is some time from now so we have done a traffic we're in the process of reviewing the traffic study um, and I think uh, you know it, Denise had alluded to the Red Hook traffic study that we are doing um, and some of the uh, as part of our traffic study we were able to expand our data collection points with coordination with our uh, freight unit to understand where we can get more data collection mm -hmm. outside the project limits of coastal resiliency project. Mm -hmm. right. So we're establishing a baseline of data collection to help with their project that's coming. Right. Right. And, and that future. certainly will help to inform uh, our understanding of how many trucks are currently using the, 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 the particular corridors and also to address some of the, the requests that we've heard from the community. Can we de-designate Van Brun Street? But we want to understand and also relay that de-designated Van Brunt Street means we need to identify some alternatives. Yeah, um, and, and I think that something that, um, and again, I don't want to take us or, uh, too much space here. I also think that maybe we should create some space to talk about the impacts of this uh, route in, in regards to public housing. Mm -hmm. But one thing that, that I would like to um, just put out there is that I think the community would be very excited of hearing of big bold ideas like how we get the trucks out of Red Hook, what happens, for example, all over here, yes. mm -hmm. right? Yes. What's happening here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Halleck, Halleck. I, never know I was about to talk about Halleck. Yeah. 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 So I think that that's more than ideas about a marine highway, yeah. and yes. it, which we also love to hear about alternatives, right? I think that um, just things that happen with these trucks that are basically out of the neighborhood because this is a very vulnerable um, um, neighborhood, both in the front and the back. I think that's the kind of thing that would yeah. be, get people excited. I don't know, is that reflective yeah. of? Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and, and this is a precursor. This gives us even more information, particularly when we come back to you in the fall to have that focused conversation. But again, the information that, that what Leg Neg mentioned, my colleague, um, is that we're now reviewing that traffic study, which we were able to expand the scope to then look at the baseline conditions. Gives us a lot more understanding and will help us to determine what other routes we can look at to, de to, to, to in terms of evaluating the truck route network. Um, so, so this is a kind of a larger step process. This was also before we got funding for this, the larger study. So we were actually doing that as a means to get funding for the broader study. Um, yes. I've already spoke, but I saw Owen. Yes, sorry. So why don't you Owen hey, hey, on Yeah, just a quick question. I mean, um, so it looks like you've got six distribution, truck distribution centers coming to the area before there's anything marine, and we recognize that. Um, so far, I haven't been able to find out any information 
on how many trucks those distribution centers are going to be generating on a daily basis, what times they're going to be running through these small two lane streets. Um, I just, I mean, is anyone here from the businesses that are coming? Because I don't know if the businesses will be able to move the trucks through because there's such a volume. Uh, you know, on 4th Avenue, I get it. You can move a lot of trucks down 4th and 3rd. But what's the study? Where, where is that information? And when can we expect that as a community to receive that information? I presume you know all of the details for all of the six facilities. So you should have that information, or if nothing else, the owner should be giving that to you so that you can make sure they can actually move their trucks. Because right now, from my transportation planning background and my uh, engineers that have looked at this, they said, this is just a parking lot. The you know Amazon trucks are not gonna be moving through Red Hook, they're gonna be idling. Yeah. DQE is a nightmare almost all, all day. day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's and not just in, the, in these certain, and Third Avenue and Sunset Park with trucks, and the schools that are there, uh, uh, they can't even. At get the bridge there. crossing, and we've got all this. We've got every all this day water. To control the traffic because the signals no longer work to be able to move um, trucks and vehicles and everybody we've through, and it's just going to get worse with the BQE. But I just want to know the information. Just share that with us because we've got a lot of transportation planners here in Red Hook. We can take that data and we can prove that they will be gridlocked. And we can call in Gridlock Sam and have him testify as well. But the bottom line is, what what's happening? Where's the action plan? And that's really the, the and concern. And who is this benefiting? Who is this benefiting? Yeah, hmm. it's the corporation. Who is this benefiting? You know, yeah, who is it? We, not my brick. We don't want this to go through Columbia Street. Absolutely. We, we don't want to affect any of the neighborhood. But you know, this this corporation stand to gain. And what about all the businesses? We already have a huge amount of trouble just getting people down here. They're stopping because it's gridlock with these trucks. You've had discussions with the corporations. Uh, how do they respond to working with the communities? Uh, it depends. I mean, Red Hook a Container Terminal obviously is uh, interested in working with communities. They understand that this is a problem for the local community and want to help solve the problem along with a company like Hughes Marine, you know, who is working with us. UPS has been uh, really uh, standing up and uh, taking a hard look and spending money uh, to try to solve these issues. Um, you know, and then there are other companies as well uh, that um, I, I'm not as comfortable naming, but they are engaged because they see this um, from their point of view as a way to build reliability into their systems, mm -hmm. you know, which because, you know, uh, I'll tell you, UPS started this journey with us because they said they just can't get the freight into New York City because we're ordering so much stuff and yeah. they're at a place where it's like every day is Christmas or the day before or the, you know, or the week before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, so, so they've been very engaged. So it's been, it's been heartening, I think for us at EDC it's, and DOT is let's see these things start to work and then more businesses will see that um, this is a real alternative. And so that's our, that's, that's what Delivering Green is about. Yeah, and then just adding to that, you know, we are in the mo at the moment right now of engaging with developers and, and, tr and transporters. We're gonna be scheduling with, I'm sorry. with developers and transporters. We're gonna be engaging with them this summer. And, and when we come back, when mm -hmm. council member invites us again, we'll be able to share kind of like what we've learned and kind of like how we're kind of informing that. Like our goal really is to provide a lot more of a push for them to have environmental kind of their environmental stewardship of their own that they can commit to providing more sustainable options for how they're going to be delivering and being a good neighbor right. that's really what's critical um, here especially with when these uh, facilities come along right. I just if, I, if I may and I don't want to take up space this is for for the residents you know I we need mitigation mm -hmm. right Absolutely. we have facilities that are being built. We haven't seen the impact of the trucks that are coming, and I don't know if y'all have those estimated. I don't know how that process works. But by our estimations, we're gonna have 3,000 additional trucks on these streets that Jesus. already can't handle what is here today. Enforcement is not happening. It never happens. 
we need immediate mitigation. I don't care if you have to build an island in the middle of Van Brunt to get those trucks to move somewhere else. So I'm interested in what are the immediate mitigation elements that we can do here that are gonna force these companies and drivers, wherever they come from, to divert to other places. And there are solutions. Residents have mentioned Halleck Street over the years and moving and Port Authority, but we're still having the same conversation and we're still watching these facilities pop up and more trucks. None of these facilities are compelled to develop to the water, to use freight. That's right. They're that's, building that's exactly. for trucks. They're not building for water. So yep. I think we have an, our DCP friends. I don't know if y'all are in here. Yeah, I think Yes, all right, DCP oh, well, friends. Um, oh, yeah. so, so, and I, this is probably DOB and some other weird agency I've never heard of. Um, <laughs> so, so can you talk to us a little bit about like, it, the truck study is going to take, I don't know how long. Well, we, we need immediate mitigation right, now. So we have some preliminary um, findings that will be coming out of this, the traffic study for the Red Hook Coastal Resiliency that we'll be looking at as a baseline. That will give us enough information that will allow us to determine what are the, if there are any immediate next steps in terms of mitigation. Um, so we'll be able to, um, you know, as we review and evaluate um, that internally, we'll be able to come back and, and talk about that. But the next step really is the point of engagement for the, the broader study. Um, we'll we'll, we'll uh, determine kind of what are kind of the short term immediate uh, items. So do we need a list of like all the damaged homes on Van Brunt and the value of that? Do we need people to count? I'm just concerned here that mm -hmm. these studies take too long. Mm -hmm. We don't have sense. the time. The urgency is now. Yeah, and you know, yeah. this is also the reason why I talked about kind of our broader toolbox and our toolkit of things that, that can be done rather quickly. And, and that's the opportunity where DOT can really come in and find find ways to to help to mitigate that so we are all working very hard on this issue as well as well as many others but this is critically important for us as we've heard this over the years um, so now that we have some of the findings from that study we'll, we'll be able to um, evaluate that so uh, again sorry there's, there's yeah. somebody with a hand up or no hand uh, yeah, this is a follow-on to a couple of the questions over here just to try to get at some of the specific facts and information that we have right now about the two facilities on Beard Street that are currently under construction and it looks like they're going to be ready at some point soon. My question is, do we know specifically the planned opening date for each of those two facilities specifically on Beard Street? And have they provided a plan as to the truck traffic, the types of trucks, the activity incoming, incoming and outgoing specifically for those two facilities at this point? Do we have any factual information? Um, some of that should be stuff, I mean, off the top of my head, I don't know what that is. So we'll probably I assume for opening dates, don't DOB might have that. Yeah, um, well, but some well, of the I think we have some sure. projections, but again, this also we goes back to yeah. some of my points during the presentation. Um, mm. As as some of these facilities are coming online as of right, that doesn't give us the, the visibility that would normally be granted to us if there's a new development or if there's a Board of Standards appeal for a new application for a new development. We aren't able to see a lot of those so, so if we don't know, just as a connection here, if we don't know when these two, specifically the ones on Beard Street, I know there are others, but if we don't know specifically when those facilities are going to open, how do we know that the study that's starting in the fall is going to be done at a relevant time? So, so we can confirm with the Department of Buildings. We certainly don't want to provide any inaccurate information. Um, they will likely have cert certificate of occupancy and, and those final dates. So we can certainly get back to you on that. Um, we, in general, from a transportation planning and engineering perspective, there are general projections from a trip generation where you, you can estimate how many trips in general. But these, as I said earlier, the types of facilities, they vary in the, the intensity and the magnitude of the trips. So we certainly don't want to 
kind of overestimate or underestimate either. So for us, that's the point of engagement with developers and also looking at the traffic study that gives us kind of a broad estimate. And then from there, we can then evaluate kind of what the, the magnitude of that impact is. Right. But actually, is there a dialogue now between the city, the agencies represented here, and the owners of those businesses yeah. in those two buildings? Is there a dialogue where they are providing information on that? on the truck traffic and what's actually going to be happening so we can fold that into the planning Yeah, analysis. can't they just be asked, I think is what you're saying. Yeah, right? like, can't you just ask them, and are, have you asked them, and are they saying yes or no? So, this may have been missed uh, just earlier, but I, I mentioned that we as an agencies will be engaging with developers and the transporters this summer. Um, so we'll be um, hoping to get some more information uh, at that time. But it's under development. But, I hear you. If I can just finish my point, thank you. Um, as Andrew mentioned, he's spoken to some of the developers already. Um, for the UPS facility, for example, they have not indicated what their direction is in terms of what uh, they are looking to develop. That's a 1.2 million um, square foot facility or, or potential facility. But they have not indicated what their plans are for that facility. We don't want to overestimate or project if they have not clearly indicated what the plans are in that particular facility. But so the one that we are able, weren't they supposed to give you an idea as to how much they plan on using? These are called business plans. Yeah, I think the frustration See, the here is the yeah. language of study yeah. versus there's like there's a house of fire here yeah. and that somebody isn't just calling before we understand many of us here because we've done many planning processes. Mm -hmm. What you as an agency, your proper structure for that is, but it's kind of like the house is a fire here. Can someone just please make a phone call? Someone senior say, tell us right now what you're estimating so that the rest of us here can begin to plan for it. I think that's, I think the, I'm kind of channel right yeah, now. And, on here. Mm -hmm. It's just like make a phone call. Yeah, we, we, and we hear you, and, and that yeah. is something that we've been working to do as a working group and as the agency has, has coalesced over the last couple of months to really get at engaging more directly with with I, I don't think i'm going to state it again now what, what i think we want yes. here is not the engaging yes, in the working yes. groups no, we no, want no. someone important to make a phone call to say give us the numbers now so we have been we have spoken in the past to uh verizon who is coming into the site on 270 uh beard street i believe is and richard? richard sorry richard, 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 the, the sugar refinery the huh the sugar refinery no it's um on it's on. It looks I've like heard. a big parking lot with little hangers. Yeah, it's a beard in Van Dyke oh, Street. Oh, on the yes. side yeah. of beard. Van Dyke. Yeah. Anyway, we have spoken to them um, because the location that they're building as of right, they've only come to us um, to request a variance on their curb cuts, and so that is the only information that we get from. Uh, we have gotten from that developer. But again, like Denise was saying, this summer we will be doing the work in order to get more information from them. It's not that they're, we're not in contact, it's just uh, they're in contact about different, for different reasons. And as they get closer to um, opening, I'm sure our conversations will be a little bit uh, in, in depth. Yeah. But that yeah. facility is the lesser of the evils that we're talking about. Uh, the other companies should have given you information by now. We've known this for probably two years now. We, I think we should have been further along. Does Amazon even pay taxes? No, but what can also happen is the is community finally gets fed up and does a demonstration uh, shuts down the bridge with a toddler or something Amazon because no one's taxes. making So I think what the, what the community is asking for is for someone powerful just to make a phone call and say, because why postpone the mystery, in other words, but anyway. Well, yeah, yeah, if you want to explain I have, explain I have a qu uh, two questions. One is about the scope of the study. Can you study. please give your name and affiliation? Oh, sorry. I'm Brooklyn. Jesse Solomon. Uh, I'm the executive director of Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation. Nice to meet you and see many of you. Um, question about the scope of the study. So now, years ago, our organization had been working with the local council member to try to develop a traffic study. It was specifically, it was a very narrow scope, like just to look at truck routes and alternate truck routes and consider the Port Authority and um, NEDC and route it through the perimeter of the neighborhood. So, and the other portion of that scope, importantly, was before the facilities came online to install cameras that would capture air quality to assess air quality as it is today as a baseline and then you know, hopefully get a sense of that air quality after. And I'm just curious if you can speak to the scope and if 
air quality cameras are already being installed or if that was part of, and I'm sorry, I missed the presentation on the coastal resiliency, um, but if that was already part of the traffic study that happened or if that's part of the scope and how much the scope is set in place for that study, basically. Um, we can certainly take that back uh, to, to confirm um, our general um, understanding of the scope is that it would look at the trips that are generated or project trips that are generated from these facilities and identify the uh, associated effects of those and, and opportunities to mitigate that in addition to looking at the complete streets design and, and kind of the vulnerable road users impact to, to this gentleman's point about placemaking and really looking at opportunities for Red Hook to, to really revitalize that in terms of the public realm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that is the second part, but I'll just say, I think the reason why, just as part of the community myself also, that the air quality piece is so important, especially right now, is so much news is coming out of these facilities in California, right? Yeah. Where communities right. are really suffering from, you know, worsened emphysema and asthma and everything. And, and so there's like a prescient moment right now to mm -hmm. fixate on that particular issue. And it does seem, at least in other places in the country, to be moving the needle a little bit with those, with these major operators like Amazons and whoever else, right? Um, so, but then the other question I had, you, you mentioned the BSA. You know, many of us know that there is the RXR LBA site on the Buckeye Terminal and the BSA hearing is coming. I've talked to Andrew about this a lot. This is the one um, on Fourth yeah. Street? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people yeah. don't know the BSA hearing is coming. When is there a BSA hearing? I think it's July 18th, either the 18th or the 19th. But somebody um, listening get that information out of the community. There are two cameras in front of me. Yeah, so it's e it's either July 18th or 19th. And the chat. So the chat oh, can... right. Got it. Got it. Sorry. Um, take a breath. No, no, no. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so, you know. I've been to many BSA hearings over the years, and it's unusual, I think, for city agencies to like speak out at these BSA hearings. And given all that we just heard about the you know commitment, the amazing commitment that we have from DOT and EDC and DCP to really activate this, you know, freight maritime highway. Um, this site, just for folks who don't know, you know, has an amazing pier that was being used prior to yeah. RXR taking over the site. The fuel facility. The and so this is kind of End like of court street. Not, you know, certainly SVIDC is fixated is very fixated on this site and thinking about how it can be part of the maritime highway project. So, uh, what kind of questions will DOT, for example, be bringing to that BSA hearing? And is there room for DOT and DCP um, to come to that hearing and kind of push, you know, BSA and to push RXR and LB, LBA to say like, yes, we're gonna build out so and design so that the site you know is open to maritime users or markets towards exclusively maritime users or what have you. Why is there even a PSA hearing? What are they trying to do? That's thank, a, thank you. It's a demapping of the street. Oh, that's right. demapping Clinton, of the street. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Clinton yeah, for the yeah. turning yeah. thing. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that came across my desk today. That application. So <laughs> we, it's getting to the right people. We're all reviewing it, and we're also planning to indicate that there should be some commitments for marine. Um, goods movement and also for facilities that, that are for the, the freight that's operating from there at least more sustainable types of delivery vehicles going out. So yeah. these are things that we try to advocate more. This gives us a little bit more leverage because it's a board of standard appeals that has a lot more due process compared to an as of right to vote. Right. And so again, you know, as we're kind of yeah. working through these, we, we are um, we are just really making sure that there's there's where there's due process, we're able to push and advocate for a lot more commitments. And just to say, the mayor's office is aware we're in touch with them, and it's really, and it comes down to in that process, what does the mayor's office want? And so mm -hmm. we, you know, we'll, we'll be speaking. Can I offer some suggestions? Yeah. So some community members on the email um, threads may have known, but for the sake of recording, the recording here and everyone else. So, um, I mentioned the Resilient Reddick meeting a while ago. Uh, we don't know what UPS is going to do, but Coffee UPS Street. is right up here next to Valentino Park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So our proposal was that at whatever point they open, to bring the trucks through Port Authority property. On through, Conover? No, so through Port Authority. Conover? No, through Port no. Authority no. property. It's Ferris and Port is Authority that, property it? through the passenger ship Brooklyn Cruise Terminal parking mm -hmm. lot would put them out at the northern end of their property. Right, but the street, I believe, there's no street. Oh. No, street. Or no street. No street. 
Okay. Oh, this is the container off. terminal. Yeah, you come right through. Oh, okay. We're coming right through Atlantic Basin. Yeah, yeah. You've, you've somehow you filled this in. What have you done to Atlantic Basin? I don't know. Let's open the. You've erased Atlantic Basin. That's the problem of. Landlubbers on a map. Yeah, GIS is a inexact science. So here's Atlantic Basin. Yeah. So UPS is here. I'm just to make it a U. Mm -hmm. And this is your Red Hook Container Terminal. The Port Authority property goes right down through here, and you could come out at the northern end of UPS without ever hitting the streets. Mm -hmm. Now I do know that the Brooklyn uh, Cruise Manager is yeah. not wild about this plan. <laughs> Interesting. It, it does run the trucks right past Portside, but it keeps UPS trucks completely off of city streets. Okay, I think, so what and I, I just, can I just do my little first, because I don't know what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, we so, have a couple of minutes, so. Let me give you the three and then you can respond, because I'm afraid that the and, other person right can check if anyone that wanted to speak didn't get a chance to Thank you. Yeah. 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 So then the other one is um, something that um, I've been talking about, Jim Tom Park, which is also not here, and it was actually started by Craig Hammerman. So Halleck hmm. Street, where are we here on the map? Where's Ikea? Right, it's this bump out. Yep. So what there's a lot of interest in connecting would be reconnecting Halleck yeah. through here. And right now there's a bizarre little this Todd triangle has been kind of would be to run this through here. Parts of it there's some illegal dumping which no one has wanted to remove right about there. There used to be some kind of easement here. So when Craig Hammerman, the former district manager of CB6, started this effort early in the Bloomberg administration, there was enough concern about trucks even then. I called him recently to double check. He said he felt, you know, Parks had done a bit of a land grab and maybe Sam Schwartz's Ikea thing had closed off the sidewalk here. But if this were to be done, it would require alienating Parks and land. Process, but, well, no, it's so according to Marty Mayer, only the state can do this. And Marty Mayer, the Brooklyn Parks Commissioner, is so adamantly opposed to that, very adamantly opposed yeah, to this. Sure. But mm -hmm. as much as I want to preserve not only Parks, but access to the waterfront, yeah. there's a slight overview here. I feel honestly the prospect of the trucks going through here, this is all parks here on both sides. Mm -hmm. This is incredibly oh. hazardous to the line for the pool, the Reddick pool vendors, all mm -hmm. of this. So we've just, we're going through a lead remediation here to make this park safe right. and clean and to ram the trucks through here. I feel it like better to sacrifice a small section of park right there. This is super, so parks department has said, because SBIDC felt the same way and parks department has said, Absolutely not. No we're not way. even well, going to enter. We're not accepting parks department. Totally. So, so we've looked up how to alienate parks land. It's a state process. So I brought the documents over yeah. to um, Marcella Matanya's so office. So that's one. So if we did that, that would lighten the load here. It doesn't allevi alleviate their exhaust or their whatever, but I think there's less traffic risk. This would take that off of there. And the other request is, and this goes to DCP, our easement. New York City has absolutely no incentive system at all for maritime use of the waterway. So you can stand here with that great language, which should make me feel, you know, joyful. But it's actually hollow words. I don't mean you personally. I spoke to Michael Morella, who's the head of, for those who don't know, City Planning's Waterfront Open Space Division last year, you know, before the, for the comment period for the Comprehensive Waterfront Planet. And I said, Michael, is there any way to incentivize use the waterways. He said, there's none. And I just can't believe that. I mean, Merit, you know, Baltimore has maritime protection zoning. Yeah. Vineyard Haven and Martha's, lots of people have maritime protection zoning. Yeah. And there could be opportunity zones at a federal yeah. level. And this is, we are suffering this, I think, really because yeah. of opportunity zones. Yeah. Rather because of- Before we wrap up, yes. hey, does anyone else have a question that didn't get an opportunity to speak? No? No, I know that. Okay, but does anyone, no, no, no. might there be the need for environmental impact statements on warehouses this large? Yes. And as part of those impact statements, as part of those impact statements, shouldn't the community have been provided with the amount of trucks, the types of trucks, the transportation, the amount of distribution? An environmental impact statement on a large warehouse doesn't seem out of line. But the idea, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to be insulting, but welcome to Red Hook. It is decades that we have been told of the preparations of the plans in preparing for the plans of the preparation of future design where we will be down the line. And here we are, 10 years after Sandy, with concrete blocks on corners, that's called flood abatement. And this, and this is what we hear. How many more times? 
How many more times? How difficult is it for all of us to do this? So then, give us something new. All right, everyone, again, thank you so much. Um, we're going to start the report out with your back portion. Um, for the DOT group, it's Matthew. Yes. Come on. Up. Actually, we should give him a round of applause. I'm not scared for this. For, for everyone that participated, and particularly I want to start by apologizing to uh, Carolina for having suggested that as we were wrapping up, just wanted to check uh, if someone else wanted to bring up the question. So um, I wanted to share some of the things that we discussed. Um, in, in this um, space, which definitely felt shorter than I think all of us uh, would like, including you know the hosts. It's definitely something that takes uh, more time than uh, we were able to allocate today. But um, we were introduced with the map for the, of the area. We started with a conversation that maybe was a little more summed up, but I think that neighbors particularly in Red Bull um, would like to have. And we sort of were able to uh, at one point zoom in and talk more about what's happening with the streets, the vulnerability of buildings, um, and sort of started to have this conversation about the particular particularities of what happens on this side of the VQX, which is kind of its own world, as people that don't <laughs> live here know. Um, and uh, sorry, I didn't really prepare for this, so. Um, Trying to break up life. Um, but a couple other things that came up, one really important that um, uh, Carolina was, uh, was bringing up was about an alternative truck route on uh, Halek, and there were some specificities discussed about the roadblocks further. But another thing that was discussed is trying to envision maybe bigger, more ambitious solutions at what is on the table because. I think that the image was, that was used to describe the feeling is that um, there's a fire in the house and someone just needs to call the um, yeah the fire the, like 911 instead of doing a study about what the best way to move forward is. So um, yeah, thank you, thank you for the space. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, maybe Chris. For the, maybe for, oh. the, for the video. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, land use and zoning group. I think our key takeaways were mostly questions. Um, first was we need triggers that say there are too many facilities in Red Hook. Is it possible to modify the self storage special permit that happened uh, about a year or two ago? Is another question. Um, we obviously need to define what last mile facility is without capturing uh, uses that we don't want to capture. And maybe there's a way to do that through measuring truck traffic. There is a plan to do a Red Hook traffic study this summer, which maybe will inform that definition. Um, is it possible, I'm sorry, this fall. Um, is it possible to address any clear and present dangers through land use policy. Um, and finally, we just talked about some of our main concerns with the prolifer proliferation of last mile facilities. They were, um, number one, eliminating space for the community to evolve and not allowing for other uses in the community. Uh, poor use of manufacturing when green manufacturing is something that is needed uh, and good jobs are needed. And third was on safe streets, and fourth, of course, was air pollution. And a final suggestion that came in was we need a grassroots campaign to say not to shop Amazon. Um, and with that, I'll turn over to Brian. You're reporting for your group? Okay. Ooh. Oh, um, and we did ask for uh, how, how can we make a moratorium happen for last mile facilities, but if I'm not mistaken, I think that may have gotten caught up with the last mile definition, which is needed possibly for the moratorium, but I'll let the DCP folks clarify that. Um, and Brian from our team. Yeah, it could be for Red Hook. The moratorium could just be for Red Hook. Okay. Yeah, okay. just for Red Hook. I'm down with that. Okay. Okay, hello. So I was with the community engagement group, 
And their main concern is that they want more formal community engagement in Red Hook. They feel like there's a lack of transparency. Uh, they feel like elections aren't really here enough. Um, they feel like there has not been enough outreach to the, especially the NYCHA houses and youth in the neighborhood. Um, you know, it's like we're at this thing and it's like kind of like where are the people from the NYCHA houses? Where are, like, like where's the neighborhood essentially, you know? Yeah. And people feel like there's a lack of outreach. They're like, how do people even know this is happening, you know? Um, they, feel, they feel like posting things on social media isn't enough. Yeah. And they want electives and other organization, organizations to do more. They want there to be more transparency. They want people to know, you know, um, what ex exactly is happening for Last Mile? Like, what is it exactly? Like, who's working on what, you know? The assembly person, what are they doing? The city council person, what are they doing? Um, you know, people just want just want more things to be known. Uh, you know, people just feel like they don't know enough, they're not being told enough. And also, uh, people also want the community to be engaged more in the, engaged more in the development that's currently happening. You know, you hear all these things about um, you know the water being developed, um, all this these shipping routes, and it's like, are people from the community going to get those jobs, you know? Are young people in the community being told about those internships, those opportunities, you know? Are these companies, these, are these corporations, are they going to schools in the area? Are they letting people from the actual community know, you know? If people from other, from outside of the city, you know, or outside of even the state, are being given these jobs, Red Hook doesn't really benefit in the same way. Those are people's main concerns. Come to the front, Marlene. Come to the front. Uh, you can't hide. I know. I'm trying to avoid you. You end up on the screen too. I know. Uh, thank you. So, a couple other things from the community group we talked about is the fact that we would like to see the community board meetings also held in Red Hook. Um, we feel that if there are meetings in Red Hook, the community here in Red Hook can be more involved. And instead, we constantly, I live in, right on, on Carroll Gardens. And so the meetings are in Carroll Gardens, Hollow Hill, Park Slope, when they've kept it, right, over Zoom, but generally not in Red Hook. And the issue has been raised that folks from that side would have difficulty getting to this side, but we have, you know, to make the point that it's true vice versa. But to me, if you have the meetings here as well, maybe once every four months, the people in this community in NYCHA can get involved. So we actually ask for that as well. And so we ask that the, uh, uh, the Brooklyn Bar President's Office get involved in that to ensure that it happens. Um, we also talked about the importance of, of place and space. And so what we're saying is that because there are so many talking points around this issue, let's have two or three places in the community that folks know they can go to, maybe to get literature and to learn about what's happening. So maybe Mikio and the Red of Rec Center and maybe even PS15, because those are the places we normally keep community meetings. So folks know they can do that. We also ask that there be um, messaging that is similar that all of us who are involved with community organizations can share. We don't make up the message, create the message, create the language, we can share it on our social, we can share it when we do flyers. That to me is one way as well that we can bring more messaging, so I wanted to mention that. And as, as, as uh, he pointed out as well, we want to ensure that we bring the voices of the youth in, because they are oftentimes the ones that are ignored, but they are the ones who are being impacted. Um, as as uh, uh, Sherry? Kelly. Kelly. As Kelly pointed out, and she's at the Southwest Brooklyn High School, some of her students are leaving to go take jobs with Amazon and others, but they have to go to Jersey and other places to do so. Mm. And so we need to think about the impact that is having on our young people, but how we can work um, to change that. And also, what does the jobs look like? Yeah. We know that Amazon, um, one of the things they've been doing is in some of their facilities, there's only four or five, four or five people per floor, right? So if that ends up being the case in Red Hook, right now we're being told that uh, some of these facilities are saying they don't have jobs. Then what exactly are we getting from them? 
what those do those jobs look like? We're told right now that Amazon is taking uh, staff from other places and bringing them to different facilities. And as I said, I think that's because that's their way of uh, uh, deterring unionization efforts. We have to look at that. But those are some of the things we talked about in terms of community engagement, definitely so that we can have one message and we can have more of the community be involved. People asking what's your name, first and last oh, affiliation. Marlene, Marlene Hansen, and I'm with Red Hook Conservancy, and we're an organization here in Red Hook, all volunteers who come out and help care for all of the 16 park and wall field spaces in Red Hook. Yes. So much. Um, so now we're going to turn over, yeah. over to the Q&A portion. If there's a lull in the questions, we have some, I think we could follow up on it. Uh, and if the agencies can come up so they can fill the questions, that'll be great. great. So um, let's keep these two questions. If you, you want to preface your, com your question, that's fine, but let's just be mindful of time and, and again, share the space with folks. So uh, who wants to go first? Any questions, please? The questions only, you're taking statements. We can do that, but let's, let's keep it to questions and shortly, and short statements. All right, all right, we're gonna take questions. So what's the process? Put the mic up to your mouth, please, so oh. people can hear us. Yeah, you, uh, sorry, you have to ask the next steps. You've got a lot of input, questions, feedback. How does that all get sort of integrated and Answered and disseminated back out to the community. Thank you. Um, for the agencies, we're going to go over there. So, thank you for your question. Uh, we are, as uh, we had mentioned at the beginning of uh, during our presentations, we have an interagency working group. So, we will be reconvening, taking notes. From what we heard during the breakout sessions and all the questions throughout uh, to get to this evening, uh, taking that back, consolidating, and also comparing notes with the council member's office, uh, and then uh, determine at the right time when it would be good for us to come back and then we, we, um, we have some work on our end to do to consolidate everything. But we thank you so much for your passionate um, plea and set of comments uh, there. Well taken. Thank you. And I think. For D38, I think one of our takeaways is that some of this stuff is very broad and city-based, and we want it to be focused in Red Hook because the situation of Red Hook is now, not 10 years from now, the ledge and other stuff to get through. And can I just say something real quick here? Um, we're we're going to take the notes from this meeting. We will repackage. We will blast back out to everybody who attended. We ask for your support in getting it out to community members. Um, and if we need to turn it into another form, Right, this is going to be the back and forth. It is what we are going to use to go back to DOT, DCP, EDC, uh, and everyone else to keep on top of what are the time frames, what are the concrete elements. There were specific asks and recommendations made here and made in the past that we've been collecting. So, you know, our commitment is to do better by community engagement to make sure we leave no one behind to keep repackaging and we trying till we get this right, right? It's a, it's a large community with many different, sometimes uh, opposing interests. But we know clearly we need to get some very clear information out there around what we all doing. I, I definitely heard you and count on you to both hold us accountable and holding the agencies accountable and also mentioning to the mayor that this is a critical issue that needs to be focused on. Um, our office has sent letters to all the agencies to say we need to have a conversation about this. This is urgent, both for the industrial manufacturing, but the zoning issues, right? There's such huge gaps here. When you build as of right, this is what you get. A lot of stuff that has no environmental impact statement, despite the fact we know the impacts are horrendous to our health and well-being. So, I realize I'm gonna start talking a lot more and this is not for me to talk to you. I just want to know what can be done to use the laws in place. Why are we not using 
the laws that have been in place that by law prohibit 65%, I'll say, as a stupid statistic, the amount of trucks that are already illegal on the street. How is that? How is that? Why, why are 90-foot trucks not given non-compliance tickets? If I go 43 miles an hour or in a 30 mile an hour zone, I get somebody on my ass in 15 minutes. So I'm out here playing traffic director, backing 70-foot trucks up in front of PS15 so the crossing guards can free the walkway because there are nine trucks backed up on Van Brunt Street that can't move. Yeah. So where are the cops? Yeah. Thank you. That um, was a question. That is a takeaway today that maybe there's some element of PD having to be here, but so. on, on, I don't know, DOT, is there something that you want to answer? Also, Emily. community strategy is there action lawsuit somewhere. Hi, so my name is Emily. I'm the CD7 liaison um, at the Brooklyn Road Commissioner's Office and six, sorry. Um, so in terms of enforcement, DOT, none of the agents here at present have enforcement capabilities, but if you do send me um, very specific locations and the issues, I can uh, hand that over to the local precinct and that's how we work in um, communication with each other. And so that's an option that you choose to take can meet me um, over here and we can exchange contact. What I say to the officer on the phone, hey, why aren't you giving him a ticket? Again, that's a question that NYPD has to answer, but if you uh, do want more true. support, um, yes, I can too. help you in the back. We, we will bring them to the next meeting. I'll go to her and then come in. Uh, thank you. Oh, sorry. This is, I'm Elise Rodekian, I'm a community member, and a question was submitted that I think is relevant um, related to um, Jack Schmidt, what you said earlier uh, in your DCP presentation about the reason why the warehouses are here is because we're zoned appropriately for them here. And I realized I wasn't in the zoning breakout, but I just wanted to um, highlight that, you know, given that Red Hook is officially, according to New York City, a climate friendly community. It's also an environmental justice community. And according to New York State, it's also a disadvantaged community. Why has the DCP not updated the zoning text? It's outdated. It doesn't account for the specific uses of these last mile facilities. And it has been fine to allow these facilities to fall under this definition of a warehouse, which these warehouses aren't. And they bring environmental concerns, noise impacts, roadbed degradation, traffic and emissions, and none of them are required to commit to sustainability. No environmental review, no flood mitigation efforts, no stormwater management. Is it okay to ask you? Like, I don't know. Right. Yeah, no permeable surfaces. So given that New York City has committed to climate solutions, environmental justice, shouldn't these facilities at the very least be required to commit to these types of climate forward measures? Isn't there a way to make them commit to that? these electric vehicles, charging maritime solutions, we can talk about that all we want, but until they have to commit to it, nothing will happen. So we want to understand the lack of action from DCP, given that Red Hook is a, a neighborhood with profound climate vulnerability. Right, you talked about the vulnerability, but climate vulnerability, and we're designated as an environmental justice community, according to the mandate of the New York State Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. in the city, where do they go in zoning? So the same thing with the last mile facilities, during the pandemic, these things really exploded um, and we're now working on ways to address their impacts and that's why we're all here tonight listening to you. So um, we will continue to work with you. 
we will find ways to address the impacts of these facilities and we've heard a lot of good information tonight. It's given us a lot of food for thought. We will take it back, discuss it amongst the working group, digest it, and hopefully the next time we come back, we'll be back with solutions. That's fine, but Red Hook's status is not new. Like This is not a new thing, so the fact that you're saying we're, we're working on it now is, again, it's... Thank you, thank you. Okay. How many more years of proposals, yeah. Yeah. of studies, considering the um, marine and all these things because they met with us and this is one of the things we said you must do this and thank god we're people are thinking about marine why these corporations and actually ups was kind of horrified they didn't know the bqe was going to be worked on they didn't do a study these things are big corporations they didn't know where they were going they didn't know we were a community and we're fighters but the pandemic broke us, you know? And we're trying to come back. And it's divided us. And these corporations, Amazon hasn't done anything. Why didn't they, Futures Inc., they're on the water. Why didn't they build? They came to, we had a meeting with them talking about Marine. And um, they just didn't build for Marine. Why? They got the money.
think one of the things that we are really incentivized to do with the new leadership at EDC is to connect uh, local communities to jobs, particularly in the supply chain. You know, we, we support schools like uh, the Harbor School, which is you know aligned with this uh, vision. Uh, the new middle school that will feed into the Harbor School. We uh, we also work with the uh, School for Global Commerce, which is uh, in Manhattan, um, and. It's so important that, and it's baked into us working with CUNY, working with SUNY, and making sure that people are prepared for this new sort of uh, paradigm with freight delivery. And uh, we're doing that with offshore wind, for instance, you know, uh, with the new offshore wind terminal, South Brooklyn Marine Terminal in Sunset Park, you know, making sure that there is that benefit to the community. If we're going to get these new uses, we have to have New Yorkers working in these places. So, so yes, we're. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Well, again, it's just kind of myopic. It focused on freight delivery as the only thing that can happen in this community. And how do we think about diversifying beyond that particular industry? Because I think about enough of that here is what you're hearing everybody say. Um, and so, what are some other uses for manufacturing or that, you know, makes use perhaps not everybody wants more residential and, and retail and commercial, but seems like that would be good to bring a bit more of that here, makes the neighborhood overall more attractive, and again, kind of enrichment of the community. Because this focus on freight delivery, I know that's what you're focused on, but it's, it's enough. I thought that's what you meant, but I would yeah. say that, you know, we have a long-standing relationship with organizations like Southwest Brooklyn Industrial Development Corporation, and that's how, you know, uh, they're more on the ground here, but uh, we have the facilities like the Brooklyn Army Terminal, um, and um, it's a variety of jobs, I guess is my point, and you're, you're making a good point, and I'm agreeing with you. So, thank you. Hi, Carolina Salguero from Portside, New York. So I just want to continue something I was saying, the brain that we for the benefit of all. So um, as someone who's uh, advocated for use of the waterways in every way since about 1999, it's great to hear this idea of using waterways and running highway and everything. But what I know from my port side work, I'm sorry this meeting, is there is currently absolutely no incentive to do that in the city. And so I'm asking all of you there right now to start looking for tools to do that. So what I was trying to say over here is I'm sure this last mile, Juggernaut is coming here because of the federal opportunities on the funds, because there was money that could be accessed to build these things here. Is there some tax incentive that the city can make for use of the waterways? I spoke to the head of the Waterfront Open Space Division of City Planning last year because of the comment period for the Comprehensive Waterfront Plan, Michael Morales' is name, and I said, is there any way the city can encourage the use of maritime? He said, no. And I just, I can't believe that that's true. And I'm begging you, I'm asking you to do it. Other cities do it. Maritime Institute of Maritime, Baltimore Institute of Maritime Protection Zone, even a smaller town like Vineyard Haven, how Marcus Vineyard did it. And I think if we have those incentives there, Amazon might have actually built for that. Now things can be retrofit, um, but if there's nothing to push them to do it, and you're basically telling us you have no tools because this is all as of right, so I'm suggesting you look for tools now. I'm, not, I'm confessing to everyone here, that kind of thing is not my expertise in maritime. I acknowledge that things operationally, how to move things by water, vessels and what they do, not about tax bases and rules and codes, but there's got to be a way, folks, and I'm asking you to find it. No, it's a statement. I'm making a statement. I'm not asking a question. Thank you, Carolee, and thank you so much. I'm turning over to Jesse. Um, there we go. To address one of the earlier questions. And, and some other context. Jesse, yeah, come to the front. Come to the front. Come to the front. Okay. Um, well, keep the microphone close to your mouth because the sound of it, the recording is tough. Okay. I'm Jesse Solomon. Uh, I know the woman just left who had this question, but I just wanted to respond to it quickly to say that um, 
SBIDC, as Andrew mentioned, works in Red Hook, Gowanus, and Sunset Park with the industrial and manufacturing businesses in the area. We also operate the city's Workforce One Industrial and Transportation Center out of the Brooklyn Army Terminal. Uh, so we partner and try to you know, encourage as much local hiring as possible, especially in the manufacturing sector in these three neighborhoods. But the other point I wanted to mention, with, I'm like on the name of the woman who just raised this issue of really diversifying the local economy, is that uh, there is and has been for a long time a really active group of retailers in Red Hook. Some of you are in the room today. Uh, the Red Hook Business Association, and prior to the Red Hook Business Association, it was SBIDC who was working to really galvanize the merchants and organize the merchants and think about even attracting another supermarket to Red Hook because there are pockets of Red Hook that really don't have access to a good supermarket or fresh produce other than the amazing farm work that's in the neighborhood. But, uh, and I think that that's something now that we're hopefully slowly coming out of the pandemic and more, you know, more merchants are working together again in the community, that that can be something that's picked up as well because really healthy food options are so critical to the health of the neighborhood. And I think that there could be some exciting ways that we can think about, you know, partnering the manufacturing sector and the uh, distribution sector really that's already rich and in this neighborhood with the retail merchants and hopefully other future small businesses that come into the neighborhood. So just wanted to shout out the work of Red Hook Business Center, uh, Red Hook Merchants Association, who's doing that already today. Can I ask an SBIDC question? Yeah, sure. Why did the SBIDC um, come out against the last uh, mile coalition zoning recommendation? Well, actually, we didn't come out against the recommendation. We said that we would like more time to um, think about whether a special permit was the best way to uh, get to some of the solutions that people are looking for. So the reason why we have concerns about a special permit is because we advocated for a special permit and won that fight for self-storage and, um, and hotels within industrial business zones. And so one concern we have is that going through that process, that triggered a tremendous, A, it took over oh, five years, and B, it tr triggered a tremendous amount of speculation in those two markets, and it resulted in a lot of self-storage and hotels being built in the industrial business zone. We're still kind of facing the impacts of that work today in the IDC. Um, and so we have some concerns, but we actually, what we said was, you know, it, I think it's Community Board 7 who is considering being the applicant on that special permit zoning text amendment, and we said, A, if you, Community Board 7 decide to be the applicant, come talk to the Industrial Jobs Coalition, which is a coalition of industrial business service providers like SCIDC, um, because the other thing we were worried about was the way the text was written. We were concerned that it would have, uh, that we could potentially impact non-large corporations, like smaller businesses who have a lot of distribution as part of their company. Mm -hmm. Come back, come back, come Because they can't hear you online. You are not that loud. They can't oh, it's online. the recording. It doesn't pick up on the recording because the echo is in here. Sorry. It's, it's, I guess it's a comment and question, but one of the things I wanted to point out when we talk about dogs, and I'm glad the, the woman who was here brought it up, is within you know, the past couple of years, we've lost the bank. We've lost the largest laundromat we had. We've lost other businesses. And when we think about the loss of the bank and um, on two of those other businesses, it's now because there's plans to build something larger on those spaces. So when we think about in terms of um, last night facilities and warehouses, we also have to think about what displacement is happening because it doesn't make any sense we talk about bringing in businesses when there won't be spaces to put up those businesses. So that's something else I'm asking that we think about more holistically as we talk about last mile warehouses, is what are the needs in Red Hub that we, we are missing, that we really would like to have? Because we were using that bank, and we lost that bank, and now as an organization, we have the bank somewhere else um, in Carroll Gardens. That the, the service we brought to the community there, I think, could have been helpful in some way. So definitely just asking that you think about that when we talk about jobs and we talk about businesses. Um, because otherwise, you know, things aren't moving. You bring in more last mile, you provide some jobs, but then we keep losing other parts of the infrastructure. It's not really helpful. And I don't 
I want to take a moment to add to that because I saw in the chat that Andrea said that we're also losing space for artists who yeah. have um, lost their ability to store the instruments that are and equipment. So that's another area of this community that's being affected are artists. Yeah. Um, so I think we're at time. Maybe we'll take one more and then I'll turn it over to the council. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Joshua Pacheco. I run the Renna Kenstein team on behalf of Labor and Safety Initiatives in conjunction with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. So my question is, and to anybody who can answer it, you know, I hear you talk about jobs, and my main thing is running engagement in the neighborhood. I run a group of residents and a monthly part meeting with CEOs and organizations of residents, including some of the seats. Um, and my, my main concern is that I hear, you know, we're getting jobs and we're targeting the charter schools and the public school. I'm also a front runner, and a lot of young men and women don't go to these schools. Yeah. Um, my major concern is besides getting jobs, can we do anything to incentivize the zip code for Burmese, incentivize people who are living in order to get these positions? I know historically, whether we were in Harbor, we're in a Harbor neighborhood, historically, people who lived here used to work on the docks. My family came here in, those, in that era. You know, I would love to see that happen again out here, where we're targeting certain schools where I know I want to be living like I went to one of the worst high schools in the city which is what my compatriots in this neighborhood also do. And are we targeting these spaces or can we get a, um, something saying that people who live here actually do get first part of those jobs? And those were the apologies. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Okay, we have, I just want to acknowledge that we have representatives from the Office of the Senior Lawyer of the Times who I think wants to speak. Yeah, just really quickly. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny. I work for the assembly member for this district. My name is Marcel Martinez. Um, just to Joshua's question about how do we actually incentivize jobs for this neighborhood. So our office has been working on a piece of legislation. It's called the New York Source Rule. It's been introduced at the New York State level that would essentially do something similar to what a zoning text amendment could do for the city level. But instead of focusing on zoning regulation, we're focusing on environmental regulation, air quality regulation. Um, and what we're really fighting for is the opportunity for the community to go through a process to review these facilities before they actually come to the neighborhood. And a critical component of that for our state legislation is this requirement that these developers actually disclose the amount of jobs that are coming to the neighborhood, whether they're unionized or not, and if they're coming to the local community. So I just want to focus us all on the fact that we are looking for solutions, and as a critical piece of those solutions is having the community actually know what is going on. Transparency, it may seem like it's not that important, and when all these bigger things are happening, it may seem like, you know, so what if we know it's happening a little earlier? But that is the key to unlocking the community to have power to negotiate for those jobs that are coming. Because right now we have nothing. So like that's just something I want to put in everyone's mind. There is so much urgency around this issue because right now we have no right to know anything. Okay, sorry, kidding. But thank you. No, thank you so much, Jenny, for that, um, to the assembly member, for all the work that you're doing. You know, I just wanted to mention also in, in this vein of transparency, um, since we came into office a giant six months ago, um, you know, we, we too have been working with the assembly member's office, but looking at city solutions, right? So the text amendment was one of those solutions that community members wanted to pursue. Um, also, looking at legislation, right? We put in legislation to try to get a licensure that would address some environmental, some labor standards. It got bumped back. Um, we were preempted by state law. We couldn't do that. So we have now legislation we're working on around licensure to see if that's another way to get at this. But truly what we need is we need the zoning to change. Um, fundamentally, and we also need our agencies to work together to center the people of Red Hook rather than the industries, because you'll you'll see that the industries were centered every time, every step of the way. So we want to reorient that conversation. We need to orient legislation around it. It's very diff this is a difficult area. Many my predecessor, I think, worked on it. Uh, and you know, it's just really challenging, but we are not giving up. And so our commitment here is to continue 
to move this forward, figure out how we can tackle it, partner with the agencies to figure out additional, more, uh, additional ways. Agency partners, we want concrete timelines. We want to know what prioritizing freight means. We want to know the dollar investment that, that, that that's going to have. When is it going to happen? How is it going to impact Red Hook? Because we don't want to continue these general conversations. So we will continue this conversation with you all. We count on our community members to continue to keep us right, to be our eyes and ears on the ground. We are working on this with you. And when we mess it up, or we, we don't do something that doesn't seem quite right, we are counting on you to set us straight. I'm looking over at Jessica, and Jessica's like, yeah, this is, no, no. As experts on the ground, honestly. Um, so I think we're gonna continue to explore and push that legislation. We expect a lot of pushback. We are up against an industry that is incredibly powerful. And do they pay taxes is a good question we need to investigate. But as Jenny mentioned, we are working with very little information, and this is not to excuse it, this is what we're trying to get at. And the experts in Red Hook, uh, and I'm looking at actually uh, John Centauri in the back here, several years ago, John was like sounding the alarm bells. He was watching the purchasing of manufacturing land happen throughout the district and was saying, y'all need to see what is happening here. And we're all too busy like, well, we've got to fight on this fight. The truth of the matter is our assets and our resources are here and we have to collectively use them to fight back against this industry, quite frankly, that is doing what it wants to do in our city. And so I'm gonna count on you to help continue organizing our residents to throw everything we can at this. Whether, again, it's a, a DOT mitigation effort, if they gotta put a little island in the middle of somewhere to stop the trucks, or it's cameras, whatever it is, we need, to, we need to throw things at it because it is urgent and it is taking over Red Hook. And we know the health impacts are too enormous. This is a crisis. So you have my commitment. We will continue this conversation. And I wanna thank you for um, coming, uh, for being here so long. I know this is a dedicated, resilient, fighting as community. Um, and so I thank you for your patience. I thank the agencies. I wanna acknowledge Dan Wiley from the Congresswoman Nidia Velasquez's office was here uh, online, uh, bearing with us. I wanna thank also Andrea, uh, who is also another longtime community member that's been fighting on this. Um, and everyone here, quite frankly, the folks that left. Again, this was a community effort. Folks said, we need a meeting, we need the agencies, we are doing that, we will follow up. So thank you again and good night.